Well, the date was December 29th, 2006. The location was the Insight Bowl in Phoenix, Arizona. The Texas Tech Red Rangers, Red Rangers, Red Raiders. Wow. Thumbs up. The Texas Tech Red Raiders were playing the Golden Gophers of Minnesota, and things were not going well at all. After the second half kickoff, Minnesota ate up almost half of the third quarter before kicking a field goal with seven minutes and 47 seconds left to put the Red Raiders down 38 to 7. For all intents and purposes, the game was over. You could hear television sets being turned off everywhere as the Golden Gophers fans started uh, celebrating and, and even the most dedicated Red Raider fans began to shake their heads in disgust. But a strange thing happened. On the next possession, Texas Tech scored a touchdown. Then they scored again, and again, and again. But they were still down 38-35 with time running out and no timeouts left. There were only 66 seconds left in the game when Tech got the ball for the final time. They started on their own 12-yard line, but a penalty moved them back to the seven. On the last play of regulation, Tech needed to make a 52-yard field goal to tie the game. The longest field goal that their kicker had ever made, even during practice, was 49 yards. The ball was snapped, the kick went up, and it was good sending the game into overtime. Tech scored a touchdown in overtime to win the game, capping off the largest comeback in bowl game history. It was a great comeback. Unfortunately, I had turned off the TV, and I didn't get to see it. In my mind, it was all over in the third quarter. What was the use of watching any more of it? Unfortunately, I didn't stick with it to the end, and so I missed out on a great ending. This morning, we're going to be looking at a man who thought that everything was over for him. But God wasn't done with him. And he had quite a comeback himself. Perhaps as we look into the Scripture this morning, we can learn a little bit about having a comeback of our own. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and, and Lord, as we open it up this morning, I pray that you would be in the midst of it, that Father, you would speak. Lord, I just, I, I just need to get out of the way, Father, it's your message, it's your word, and Father, I pray that we would be changed from hearing it, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Our passage this morning is 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. If you're using one of the Black Pew Bibles, you'll find it on page 351. Now, Elijah, Elijah was a great prophet of God, and he had been through a very trying and very joyous occasion. He had called King Ahab and his wife Jezebel to task for their worship of false gods, Baal and Asherah. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Jezebel had been killing off all of the prophets of God. There had been a drought in the land, and God was about to bring it to an end. But before, before he did that, God made it clear to Abraham, to Abraham, to Elijah, that he was the one who would bring the much needed rain. And we know the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal up on the top of Mount Carmel. The priests of Baal trying desperately to elicit a response from their supposed God, all to no avail. I mean, by the way, that shouldn't have come as a surprise because I'm sure they had been praying desperately, trying to get rain for the past three years. And Elijah calls on God, and his offering is consumed by fire falling from heaven. 
I mean, what a scene that must have been, right? And the people fall on their faces and they worship God. They rounded up all of the false prophets that were there and they killed them, all 400 of them. And the rain came and God was shown to be the one true God. What a spiritual victory that was. Elijah must have been on cloud nine. But then trouble stuck. King Ahab told Jezebel what happened. And instead of recognizing God for who he is and worshiping him, she was furious. And she threatened to kill Elijah. And Elijah, for his part, took off for the wilderness. You know, I love the fact that the, the Bible doesn't shy away from the times in people's lives where they fall short. It helps me you know, to see that there's hope for me. Elijah was exhausted from his ordeal, and he fell asleep. And the Lord provided food and water for him, and after eating and drinking and resting, he begins a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb. And that's where our passage picks up. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 9, uh, 9 and 10. <clears throat> there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah has, has come to Mount Horeb, and it's not by accident that he's there. Mount Horeb is another name for the place that we know as Mount Sinai. And God speaks there. He's done it before. In Exodus chapters 3 and 4, we read of God speaking to Moses in the burning bush. And then again in Exodus 19, as the Israelites were camped around the mountain, after leaving Egypt, God speaks to Moses and he establishes his covenant with the nation of Israel. So God does speak there, and that's why Elijah has come there. And so we find Elijah on Mount Horeb, but he's hiding in a cave when God reaches out to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? It's a very simple question. And at a surface level, we already know why he's here. Okay? Jezebel's trying to kill him. And he's been running for his life. The queen's gunning for him, and she's a pretty ruthless woman. She's already been killing off all the prophets of God that she can find. And Elijah, he pours out his heart to God. He says, God, I've, I've done my best, but it really Hasn't helped. I, it's really been all for nothing. In case you haven't noticed, God, those Israelites have been doing some pretty awful stuff. I mean, look at what's been going on. They've broken down, you know, they've, they've forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars, they've killed your prophets. God, that's some pretty nasty stuff they're doing. And now I'm all alone, and they're coming after me. Does that sound? It all familiar to y'all? All this stuff about covenants and altars and, and prophets. What could Elijah's complaint some 2,800 years ago have to do with us today? Well, let's, let's break down what Elijah said and, and see if maybe we can see what it has to do with us. Elijah said he's been out working for the Lord, right? We can relate to that. At least I hope we can. You know, it's what we're called to do as Christians. It's the Great Commission, right? We're to go out into the world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them uh, all about Jesus, everything, until everybody hears about Jesus. We're to help the world understand that without Christ, they're lost. And ultimately, they're hopeless. 
So at least that part applies to us, right? Maybe we should be as zealous as Elijah was. Remember, he's just come from an encounter with the king and 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah in front of this huge crowd of people that were Baal supporters. I think he might have been a little apprehensive as he approached Ahab and then went up that mountain. I would think so. You know, we tend to think that the, that the people in the Bible are, are just somehow superhuman. But, you know, they were men and women just like us. The difference is that they chose to follow God when he said, go. They overcame their fears. They trusted in the Lord. We're not likely to run into 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah down at the grocery store. But maybe we can confront just one person this week with their need for the redemption that's offered by Christ. Elijah goes on to explain that he's been so zealous for the Lord and why he's had to be so zealous. First, he says that the sons of Israel have been in rebellion by forsaking the covenant of the Lord. Okay. So what does that have to do with us? What he's saying is that his society, his community, those who live around him are ignoring the moral commands of God. They're living unethical, immoral lives. Jesus summarized God's law like this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This they were not doing. Has our society changed so much? I mean, certainly when you look around, you can see that, that our society is, as a whole is immoral and unethical. We see it every day. All we have to do is watch the news. Another financial scandal, another murder, maybe a robbery or two. These are the high profile examples of what goes on in our society every day. But maybe more damaging than those are the things that go on at a lower level. Things that don't make the news. Spouses cheating on each other. People stabbing each other in the back for a promotion or even just a little recognition. People lying to each other. Divorce, covetousness, and so on. As a society, we have forsaken our relationship with God. So maybe this part applies to us also. How can we affect society's moral and ethical behavior? Well, first, we need to make sure that we live as moral and ethical people. See, no one will care what we say if we're doing the same things that they are. There's a name for that. It's hypocrisy. And folks, there's already too much of that in the world. Second, we need to hold each other accountable. That's a bad word, isn't it? But you know, sometimes we fail. Even when we try, we fail. Sometimes we have blind spots and, and we can't see what we're doing and how it's harming ourselves and other people. So let's help each other. You know, that's really what accountability is about. We must live morally. Maybe then we can impact the morality of the world. Elijah also says that he's had to be so zealous because the people have torn down God's altars. The Israelites had literally torn down the altars that were used to worship God. And in their place, they had erected altars to false gods, to Baal and Ashtoreth and Anath and Astarte and, and so on. You know, today, you know, we don't usually physically tear down places of worship. Instead, 
what we do is we build up new altars. Substitute altars. We build altars to our God. Fame, fortune, family, physical beauty, nature, and so on. None of these things is evil in and uh, excuse me, in and of itself. I mean, after all, Elijah was famous, as were Moses and Paul, and Abraham was rich. And as far as our families are concerned, we're commanded to be fruitful and multiply and to take care of them. Esther, Esther was beautiful. Jesus appreciated the beauty of the world around him. The problem comes when these become an end unto themselves. When we desire these things more than we desire God. And certainly this applies in our times. I mean, let's face it, we have people who are famous just for being famous. You know, when you say Kardashians. We need to restore proper worship. And the place to start is with ourselves. We can get caught up in these things just as much as the rest of the world. Often, we do it without even realizing that we're doing it. Am I more concerned about what someone thinks of me? Or am I more concerned with sharing the gospel? That's fame. Am I more concerned about getting that next raise so I can buy a new TV or a car or a house or whatever? Or am I more concerned with managing my finances in a godly way? That's fortune. Am I more concerned with spending next Sunday fishing with my son or spending time with God? That's family and nature. I mean, I could go on and on. We need to quit building up altars to false gods. Our society is going to continue to worship false gods. We can't expect anything different from them. They don't even understand that's what they're doing. But we, the people of God, need to tear down our astral pole and grind up our golden calf. And rebuild our altar to the one true God. We must worship rightly. Then maybe our world will start to understand the difference that true worship makes. Elijah next says that the people are killing the prophets of God with the sword. And certainly Jezebel has been doing this. But Jesus said that Israel in general has killed the prophet. Fortunately, this one doesn't apply to us. Oh, wait. Maybe it does. According to the World Christian Database, 171,000 Christians are murdered re- worldwide each year just for being Christian. That's 468 people every day. They've done nothing to incur this wrath except to dare to name the name of Jesus. The problem has not gone away. But you say that's worldwide. You know, we see it on the news, but that sort of thing doesn't happen here in the United States. And for the most part, you know, that's true. We don't, as a society, as a society kill the prophets of God with a sword. No, we're way more subtle than that. The purpose of killing the prophets of God was to destroy the message of God. To see that it was never proclaimed. Now, does that sound familiar? The society around us is doing everything that it can to see that the message of God is no longer heard. They seek to stop us in the court of public opinion. and So many times, you know, we actually help them do it. They seek to stop us in the education of our own children. They long for the day when the word of God is no longer heard. 
And so we must speak boldly for the Lord. We cannot, we cannot be silent and allow the word of God to be stilled. Elijah goes on. He says, and I'm the only one left. And can you hear his frustration there? He's not necessarily saying that he's the only one left at all, but he's the only one left that's taking a stand for God. And I'm the only one left. Did you hear his resignation there? And now they're trying to kill me too. Oh God, I'm, I'm alone. And I fear for my life. You ever felt that way? Lord, everything's piling up on me. I don't think that I can do this anymore. Things just aren't working out the way that you envisioned them. I'm reminded of a time a few years ago when my son Chris called me from college. I think it was during his junior year, and he was, he was having a rough time in some of his classes. And he was totally frustrated and he was very discouraged. He said, Dad, I just don't think that I can do this. And why is that? Well, I'm having a tough time in, and things aren't going the way I think that they should in my horn class. And one of my teachers isn't cooperating. And I don't think I can, I can do this. I think that maybe I need to find something else to do. Now, if you're the parent of a college kid, those are the worst words that you can ever hear. I want to change my major. But what Chris needed was reassurance. He needed to understand that, that Susan and I believed in him. We believed in his dream. He'd wanted to teach middle school band since he was in a sophomore in high school. It's all he ever wanted to do. Okay, well, he wanted to be a killer well trainer when he was sick, you know, at SeaWorld. But other than being a killer well trainer, that's all he wanted to do was be a middle, middle school band teacher. And I remember that I told him that if I didn't think that I thought that he could make it, I never would have let him start down that road. I knew that he could make it, but he needed encouragement. His world was collapsing around him and he needed to know that he was not alone. That's where we find Elijah right now. God, I'm all alone. Everything is going wrong. Everyone is against me. I don't think that I can keep on doing this. He needs some encouragement. And God is about to provide it. Let's see what happens. 11 through 14. The Lord said to, to Elijah, the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. God tells Elijah to get out of the cave. That is, quit hiding in there and come see what's about to happen. Because the Lord is about to pass by. And as God was preparing to go by Elijah, there was a huge disturbance. First, there was a great windstorm that was tearing the mountain apart. And 
breaking the rocks, and Elijah's in the cave, and, and pieces of the mountain are falling all around him. That must have been both, both awesome and terrifying at the same time. But the Lord was not in that wind. Then there was an earthquake, and the mountain shook in the presence of the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake either. And then fire, flames shot down or shot all around the mountain. You know, that sounds like a great Cecil Bill B. DeMille movie, doesn't it? But once again, the Lord was not in the fire. Then after the fire, the sound of a gentle whisper. Or as the King James puts it, a still, small voice. And then, in that gentle whisper, Elijah hears God speak. And that's quite a contrast, isn't it? We would expect that God would be in those massive displays of nature. But He wasn't. And while we may think that that's odd, it follows a pattern that God used as He spoke to Moses and gave him the law in Exodus 19. It says this in Exodus 19, 16 through 21. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, You see, there was a huge storm there. There was fire, there was a violent earthquake, and then the Lord spoke. So what's the purpose of all these huge displays of nature if it's not that God is speaking through them? In Moses' case, it was so that the people of Israel would have some grasp of the mighty power and majesty of God. But in Elijah's case, there was no one else around. So those things must have been for Elijah alone. What was Elijah's complaint? To paraphrase, he said, Lord, I'm all alone. They're coming after me and I'm afraid for my life. And so God demonstrates his power and his majesty in order to reassure Elijah. There was no reason for Elijah to be afraid. God, the master of the storm, of the earth, of the fire, was speaking to him. That must have been an awesome experience. In, in some ways, I'm sure it was terrifying at the same time. See, but, but God wasn't coming to him to terrify Elijah. He was coming to reassure him. God was reminding Elijah that he had the power necessary to do whatever needed to be done. Because nothing is too difficult for God. You know, sometimes, sometimes God does speak in the wind. In Exodus 14, God causes a great wind to part the Red Sea. And doing so, it speaks volumes of his provision and his love for the Hebrew people. Sometimes he speaks through an earthquake. In Numbers 16, the earth opens up and swallows the followers of Korah, and God speaks definitively for the leadership of Moses. Sometimes, God speaks through fire. In Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, the fire of God falls from the sky to consume not only Elijah's offering, but also the wood and the stone and the soil. And it speaks decisively of the one true and living God. And so we must listen carefully. We must listen carefully in order to comprehend the voice of God. It might be that it is in the spectacular 
that he's speaking. But that's not how God addresses Elijah here. In that gentle whisper, Elijah recognized the presence of the Lord. And when he heard it, he wrapped his cloak around his face because he knew that he could could not look at God. And he approached the entrance to the cave where he was hiding in that still, small voice. God asked him again, What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, Elijah, what have you learned? And Elijah replies. But his reply in verse 14 is the same as verse 10. God, the sons of Israel have despised your covenant. They've destroyed your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I'm all alone and now they're trying to kill me too. You know, you would think after all of those fireworks that Elijah would have been fired up and ready to go. But no, Elijah still wants to sit in the cave and hide out from the world. And that's hard to imagine, isn't it? What about us? Do do we see God at work and then go out ready to conquer the world for him? Do we read in God's word of his majesty and power over all the earth and then rush out in the world to accomplish his will? Or do we say, God, it's hard out here. People really don't want to hear what I've got to say. It doesn't seem to make a difference what I do. I'm just going to worship you here. I'm going to read my Bible at home and spend a whole lot of time praying. That way, Lord, I can follow you more. Get out of the cave. Quit hiding. Can't you see that Satan wants you there? If you're hiding, then you're not working. Satan has it easy. He can only succeed when we fail to go out into the world with God's message. We cannot sit. We cannot sit by and watch as the world slowly dies. We must respond appropriately. And see, and God's not going to leave Elijah there at the cave. Elijah may think that there's nothing more that can be done, but God still has a lot more in store for him. God has more for Elijah to do, and so Elijah must be obedient. 1 Kings 19, verses 15 through 18. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came, that is to Elijah, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from uh, Abel-Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of, of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So God listened to Elijah's complaint. But God knows things that Elijah doesn't know. God already has his plans and Elijah is part of them. God has already given Elijah the display of his power. He's already shown Elijah that he has the power to carry out his plan. And now he's giving Elijah his marching orders. Elijah, get out of the cave. Go back the way you came. Go back to the people that you're supposed to be ministering to. They need you, Elijah. They might not understand it, and you might not understand it, but they need you. I put you there for a reason. So don't abandon your mission. And the same is true for us. 
God has given each one of us a mission. He's put us where He wants us. We may not understand it, but we're here where we are for a reason. Don't abandon your mission. We must work diligently, diligently wherever God has placed us. He may move us, but that's His decision, not ours. And God tells Elijah that after he gets back, he has something to do. God says, I want you to anoint Hazael to be king of Syria. And I want you to anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. And I want you to anoint Elisha to be your replacement. And God is very specific about what he tells Elijah to do. And so, what he's going to do must be important. Let's take a minute to see who these three people are. And how they fit into the history of Israel. The first person that God tells Elijah to anoint is Hazael. He's to be appointed king of Aram, that is, king of Syria. So why is he significant? Under his rule, under Hazael's rule, Aram constantly harasses and attacks Israel. He eventually takes over a large part of Israel east of the Jordan. So he's a foreign king that dominates Israel and oppresses them. The second person that Elijah is to anoint is uh, Jehu, son of Nimshi. And why is he important? After Jehu becomes king of Israel, he kills all of the remnants of Ahab's family and also kills all of the prophets of Baal. Third person Elijah is to anoint is Elisha, who, after an apprenticeship with Elijah, takes over as the prophet of Israel. So Elijah is to anoint three people. And we will look at Elijah's original answer to the question, what are you doing here? We notice that he had three complaints. Elijah's first complaint was that the Israelites had rejected God's covenant. We read in Deuteronomy 28 that one of the curses for breaking the covenant was that the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. And so God is answering Elijah's complaint through the oppression of Hezael and the Syrians. Elijah's second complaint was that the Israelites had broken down the altars of the Lord. In 2 Kings 10, Jehu destroys the temple of Baal. Again, God answers Elijah's complaint. Elijah's third complaint. The Israelites had put God's prophets to death by the sword. By establishing Elisha, God is answering and showing Elijah that his word will carry on. There will be other prophets. And so again, God answers Elijah's complaint. And Elijah had one other complaint. I'm the only one left. And God answers that uh, complaint as well. Yet, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. He tells Elijah that there are thousands of people in Israel who have not been corrupted by Baal worship. There are thousands who are are faithful to the Lord. Elijah, you are not alone. You see, God already had a plan for dealing with all of the things that Elijah was concerned about. Elijah just needed to get busy carrying out the instructions that he'd been given. Elijah needed to continue doing what God had told him to do. And in the same way, we must continue faithfully in whatever it is that God has assigned to us. I need to point out something here. Elijah himself didn't manage to anoint all three of the people that he was supposed to. He did not see the culmination of his assigned work before the Lord took him home in a whirlwind. 
Instead, Elisha was the one who anointed Hazael. And another prophet anointed by, uh, appointed by Elisha anointed Jehu. God had assigned him those tasks knowing that they would be completed by others. And so we come to realize two things. First, the work that we do for the Lord is His work. It's not ours. And the second thing is that we must continue our work until God calls us home. You know, like Elijah, we may never see the results of our ministry here on earth. That's okay. We may not even be able to finish what we've been assigned. That's okay too. See, the results are God's, not ours. And He will raise up others to carry on His work. Because God is the one with the power to accomplish His plans. So don't cave in when the going gets tough. Don't cave in when things don't seem to be going the way that you want them to. Don't cave in when resistance comes. Don't cave in when fear strikes. Don't cave in to self-doubt and self-pity. Don't cave in to the lies of Satan that are designed to drag you down. Don't cave in. Get out of the cave and see what God still has planned for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and help us, Lord, to, to listen to you today. Father, help us to, 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 to be able to comprehend the plan that you have for us. Because, Lord, as your people, you have given us uh, you are giving us work to do. And it says we've been, Paul said we've been saved by grace, but we've been saved for the works that you have already put before us, already planned beforehand for us to do. So Lord, help us to see where it is that you want us to serve, how it is that you want us to serve, because Lord, we desire to serve you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or do we want to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Father, we thank you for the story of Elijah. Lord, and so many times we've been just like him, and we've, we've just cowered back when we should be racing forward. Lord, forgive us for that. I thank you that, that even in the Bible, Lord, we see the, the faults, and we, we see that, that people... Your people back then were just like we are now. So, Father, reassure us. Help us, Lord, as we go out to do your work today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.